Hi, my name is Maggie. I am with Lighthouse Immigrant Advocates, and this video is meant to show you how to conduct an intake interview with our Afghan friends. Uh, the reason our new resettling Afghan neighbors are coming to us is to start their immigration goals as they enter the U.S. Unfortunately, when um, refugees come to our country, they are not guaranteed a status. They aren't all set to go. So it's important that they either get started on an asylum process or potentially other immigration type cases to get them an actual confirmed status in the United States. So that's what your interview will be um, the goal for. Um, you as the intake specialist are going to help us figure out what kind of case we would be processing for them. Majority of the Afghans that we've been interviewing are going for an asylum case, but there are other situations where maybe it would be a special immigrant visa, sometimes referred to as an SIV, maybe an adjustment of their current status if they have some kind of connection with family here in the U.S. that have legal permanent residency or citizenship. Those are more rare from what we've seen, uh, but the goal is to figure out what path they can take to reach their immigration um, goals at the end. Uh, when you do sit down to conduct the interview with our Afghan clients, you'll have a laptop in front of you with a Word document, and that Word document will be specific to the client with their name and case ID number. You'll be handed a manila folder that has the client's name, uh, hopefully what language they speak, might be Dari, might be Pashto, and then their case ID number or OAR number. That is just their specific case number with our office, typically three digits. I think we're in the 140s or 150s right now. So when you're taking your interviews, um, it might be further along the, the number line for that. I have just a word copy. I'm sorry it's not more fancy, but that's what we're doing as I make this recording. Um, the first page of the intake interview is just general information about the client, who's conducting the interview, um, their ID number, and what kind of documentation they may have brought with them. Um, a lot of the information that you'll need to fill out in this first section can be found on an, a document called I-94. Um, most of our clients should have that with them or we've already printed a copy for them, but you'll be able to find the client's full name, their class of admission. Most of the time that has been OAR, so you can enter that in there. Um, a very important date is the date that they entered the U.S., so not when they resettled to Michigan or if they came from another part of the U.S., but it's actually their entry date into the U.S. because that will determine um, how quickly we need to process their asylum case. Typically, someone um, being granted asylum has just one year from their entry date into the U.S. to file for asylum. So that date is very important. And again, you'll find that on the I-94 document. The lower section of the first page is a list of documents that the client may have. That could be a passport, photo ID, um, employee authorization card, or employment authorization um, application, a social security card, um, their own national ID uh, that has their photo on it um, and typically has a lot of Pashto or Dari written on it, but potentially um, English writing on the opposite side. Other documents would be birth certificates, marriage certificates. Um, just looking at the list here, um, very important ones would be proof of service for any, any kind of employment that they operated with the U.S. government. So that could be um, employee ID cards, military ID cards, letters of recommendation from the U.S. Embassy, um, any kind of application for immigration. Like I mentioned earlier, SIV or Special Immigrant Visa, that's a very important document that we would be looking for because they've already filed a petition with the U.S. government. So look for those. You may also come across a document called Chief of Mission, and that has to do with the SIV or Special Immigrant Visa cases. Again, you don't have to remember all of these documents. I'm just trying to kind of put an earworm in there for you so that you start to recognize some of the documents that will come through. And then our legal reps will be reviewing them later. But it's helpful if you can just 
simply check them off on that first page of the interview. Um, any other things would be um, threat letters. These are letters where they've described um, having experienced harm, threat, torture, anything like that, that proves that they were in harm's way while living in Afghanistan and that they had to flee because of it. Um, if you do have any other questions about that, feel free to let us know. But a lot of that documentation, you'll just have to start to get a feel for it for each person that you interview. Um, if you miss one and don't check it off, no worries. We just want to make sure in the end we have copies or scanned copies um, in some situations. We may not have a printer, but copies of those documents so that we can review them. So that's page one. Your information, their information, and any kind of documentation that they may have with them. Uh, the second page has to do with their history. Um, immigration history. These are all questions having to do with whether they've applied for any kind of petition in the past with the U.S. government for um, coming to the U.S. It could be a student visa, um, a tourist visa, that special immigrant visa I've mentioned, that could be one, um, or maybe they've had a family member apply for them in the past. I've seen kind of mixed responses for those kind of questions. Most people have never left Afghanistan, have never traveled to the U.S., had never petitioned to come to the U.S. or filed for visas or anything like that, but you may come across some families that have, in fact, um, applied for visas to the U.S. So go through, um, obviously, if someone has said that um, they've never entered the U.S. before their most recent entry, some of these questions won't pertain to them. One other question that I wanted to highlight is whether they have been interviewed at the border by immigration agents. Almost all of our families, if not all of the families coming through, have spoken with different immigration officials as they traveled through different countries and eventually to the United States. Most of the time as they kind of checked in to different countries, they did have people ask them questions. Um, it may not have been a very in-depth immigration type interview, but they may have asked questions. So feel free to clarify that in the blanks listed below the questions. On that same page is family history. Um, these questions we want to make sure um, if they have any relatives living in the United States. Um, no need to list their names or um, identifying information for those relatives. It can just be they have a cousin who lives in Virginia who has two young children and a sister-in-law who's now in Florida with her husband and another sister-in-law. You know, maybe list the state and the relationship to them, but no need to list names or identifying information about the family. Another question is asking, is this an unaccompanied or non-biological child? This is asking specifically about the children in their care. We want to make sure that the children that have come with them are not unaccompanied, which means they're not with their actual biological parents. Um, so it might be a strange question to ask a family, oh, is this your biological child? That question is just to make sure it's not um, a nephew or another relative um, that we need to be aware of is not a direct child of theirs or if maybe it was a neighborhood child that was traveling with them and is not related to them whatsoever we definitely would need to make note of that that technically that would be an unaccompanied child that came with them um, in my experience i've never had someone have an unaccompanied child with them but that would be processed very differently for their immigration case. So that's what the biological question is for their children. Um, if they seem puzzled by it, just say, this is just to make sure that they're part of your family unit and we wouldn't have to file additional paperwork if they're not directly related to you. And then the final question on that second page is time in the US. We just wanna know if they've had any kind of interaction with police, um, or if they've had any kind of interaction with immigration officials outside of when they first entered the United States. So if they've been pulled over, if they've been approached by a police officer, anything like that, we'd want to be made aware of. Moving on to, t uh, to page three, um, this is asking about their current living situation. We want to make sure that all of their needs are being met. 
um, find out who they live with, where they live. Um, many of our Afghan families are still in temporary housing at a hotel in Grand Rapids. So if that's the case, let us know that. They're temporarily in a hotel, they have food, they have um, clothing, they have all of these amenities. You'll notice that they have different questions on page three, um, clarifying that they do have all different needs met. Same thing with transportation, access to medical care, housing, food. Um, many of our clients, again, we've had to say that they're in temporary housing, but they are currently looking for a more permanent housing. Usually their um, resettlement agency, which would be Bethany Christian Services or Samaritas provides food or is covering rent, or maybe they're connected with a sponsoring church that helps supply a lot of those needs. It might be that they have a bridge card, uh, formerly known as food stamps, to help get groceries for them. They might get rides from their sponsor, or that might be a need that they do not have access to transportation for someone to drive them to the store. We definitely want to know about that. Obviously, if anything else comes up with general needs that they have, be sure to write extra notes so that we're aware of that. We might not be able to serve those needs, but we would like to try. And if not, we can connect them with other resources. Um, if there are any big things that we need to know about that maybe their needs are not being met, please be sure to make note of those as well. We want to know the good and the bad. Moving on to page four, this is about their um, where they were born, um, if they've been to any other countries, if they've lived in any other countries, and what their travel looked like leaving Afghanistan. So starts off with what city and country were you born in. Um, try your best with spelling, or if you have the interpreter present, please have them try to let you know what the spelling would be if it's different provinces. Um, if they did live in another country, we want to know uh, what their status was. Did they live in Pakistan for two years while they studied? Did they move to Pakistan and were assigned a different status in Pakistan? Those kind of things we definitely need to know because um, that changes their immigration history in when we're filing their, their cases. Um, as far as when they actually left Afghanistan, we are aiming to know the date that they left, any countries that they traveled through, relatively how long were they in those different countries. For example, many of our clients um, flew out of Kabul in Afghanistan. They maybe went to Qatar for several weeks. Maybe they were there a day, then they flew to Germany. Germany, maybe it was just a couple hours or they were housed at an army base there. Then they flew to Washington, D.C. and they were placed in a refugee camp in the U.S., maybe through a military fort for four weeks. Then they were in Wisconsin for a month and then they came to Michigan. Um, the dates aren't uh, needing to be as specific, you know, for arrived, left, arrived, left. Um, but we would like to know generally what that timeline looked like, especially knowing what their entry date was into the U.S., which you would be able to find on their I-94, and roughly how long they were in each country or different states within the U.S. before coming to settle in Michigan. Asking about their educational level, um, it might be that um, they just attended primary school. It might be that they graduated from high school, went on for a bachelor's degree. We've had a wide variety of educational levels um, with the clients that we've been interviewing. So it's important to find out that information, but to still be sensitive that culturally, it wasn't always um, an open option to a lot of our Afghan friends to attend school. What type of work they've done, whether it was with the US military, was was it with the Afghanistan military that partnered with the US? Did they run a home business? Were they an interpreter with different um, military services? Were they um, a stay-at-home parent taking care of the children? Were they an activist? Were they a pilot? Um, figuring out their work experience and also trying to figure out if it is a way that they were linked with the US Army, they were linked with US services, um, those kind of things are also important to know. Moving on to page five, um, this is asking about languages that they speak. Um, many of our clients are multilingual. It could be Dari, Pashto, Urdu, 
um, English. We've had a lot of professional interpreters come through that speak very quality English, which we love. Um, or there could be uh, more tribal languages that you might need some help with some of the spelling, but it's amazing to see the different languages that come through. Uh, we also want to determine um, if they had any kind of um, alliance with different political organizations, um, community groups, social groups, uh, because sometimes that can set us on a different path for um, asylum or immigration processes. So um, whether it's community involvement organizations, political involvement, um, college groups, anything like that, it's okay to list more. Um, some of our clients say, no, I wasn't associated with any kind of groups and that's fine too. We just wanna know if there are any associations we should be aware of. Um, and then uh, on that same page five, uh, question 29, I'd like to read. Have you ever worked directly or indirectly or under duress for the Taliban? Um, some of our clients were working against the Taliban um, for a number of years, working with the US or with Afghanistan um, army, which was against the Taliban. Some of our clients have also um, had to work under duress for the Taliban, that that was the only way for them to stay safe was um, having a small business and providing services to them. Um, or maybe they were indirectly involved with the Taliban. They may not have worked right directly for the Taliban, but provided another service, which in that in turn um, may have been provided to the Taliban. So um, be aware of those different connections. These questions, we wanna make sure that we're not um, leading them, that it's a safe space for them to answer honestly so that we can get a full picture of what their experiences were back in their home country and we know how best to process their immigration case. Um, question 30, the next question at the bottom of the page five. Um, this is a big one. Um, this is trying to determine their story and what things looked like when they left Afghanistan. It specifically says, what happened in Afghanistan that made you want to leave? This is where we'd really like to get a long narrative from our clients. Um, this is to try and figure out um, what motivated them to leave? What kind of harm were they in? What kind of work were they doing that put them at risk? What was happening to their family members um, that made them come to the airport? that made them walk to another safe space and into another country. Um, this is trying to figure out why they had to leave and can point us um, in a great direction as to how we can file their case for asylum or possibly other opportunities. Asylum itself can be processed down many different avenues. So this helps us figure out what the risks were, why they had to flee, um, what kind of danger they were in or their family was placed in due to their work or their experience or um, maybe their religious beliefs, their gender identity, their sexual identity, um, whether they were a female, whether they were abused. Um, many different pathways can come along just for asylum. So this narrative will really help us figure out what kind of remedies they would be eligible for. Moving on to page six, this continues trying to figure out what they would be eligible for in terms of asylum. Um, these are questions asking if they were harmed or threatened or were intended to be harmed or threatened based on different categories. So whether um, they were um, directly threatened by people in their community, in their workplace, in their neighborhoods, in whatever circumstances where they were going to school, anything like that. Um, we'd like to know if it was reported to the police, um, what kind of threats it were. It's possible that they may not have reported anything to the police because it wasn't safe to report those things. It would put them at higher risk. And we'd like to know about that too, if they didn't feel safe reporting it. A big question um, we ask everyone is, are you afraid to return to Afghanistan? Again, we don't wanna lead the answer to um, the client. We want that to be a safe and open space where they can answer, but almost everybody says yes. They're afraid to return to Afghanistan, their own home country. 
Um, we also, in that same line of thought, we want to know um, if they have a political opinion or affiliation that is against the current government of Afghanistan. That's saying, do you have a political belief or um, an affiliation that places you against the Taliban? Um, I kind of assumed that everyone would answer yes, but you'd be surprised a lot of people say no. Um, some people say no, you know, I don't, I don't really mess around with politics. I don't have an affiliation. I just am, am against how they treated women or I'm against how they treated my family. So this, um, it may not be a black and white. Yes. My political organization organization was against them. It might be more like, well, I just, they were harming people. I don't have this political belief or affiliation, but um, I didn't like the way they were treating my family. I didn't like the way that I was in danger because of them. So you can kind of suss that out if you um, are unable to say a yes or no from them. You can explain that in the notes. You know, they don't really have a political opinion, but they didn't like the way that women were treated. And that kind of falls in line with that. On the same page of page six, uh, question 35, are you a member of a particular religious sect? And if yes, what is the name of your religious sect? This question is specifically trying to determine um, if uh, the client was um, belonging to any kind of religious organization or religious group, but also trying to see if that was cause for asylum, were they persecuted because of that belief? Um, majority of our clients have answered, no, 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 I'm not part of a religious sect. I always try to clarify, oh, well, are you a practicing Muslim? Do you identify with Sunni or Shia? Um, that can be another way to parse out the answer to that. So they may have been um, following Islam. They may be part of a Sunni group or Shia group. Um, but they may not have been persecuted because of that. I just try to suss out what their religious faith is. And then later we can ask questions um, if they experienced harm or threat or felt uncomfortable because of their religious belief. Um, we also go on to ask questions if they've been harmed or threatened due to their nationality. Um, this can be a little bit of a confusing question too nationality wise they are afghans um, but this has to do more with ethnicity we're trying to determine if their asylum would be based on um, being persecuted due to um, their nationality or ethnicity there are a lot of different um, ethnic groups throughout afghanistan and we have spoken with clients that have been persecuted by community members or even family members because they or their spouse um, are from a different ethnic group and therefore were targeted or threatened or harmed because of that. So that's what that question is aiming to do. Um, similarly, um, the very last question on page six, number 38, is asking if they felt uncomfortable or harmed or threatened due to um, their sexuality or their gender. Uh, this is to determine if they would be eligible for a certain asylum tract due to um, how they identify with their gender or sexuality. That can be another path that we can file in regards to asylum. And finally, we're on the last page, page seven. Um, the top question is to see if there potentially would be any kind of domestic violence, domestic abuse, um, between the relationship, uh, married or girlfriend, boyfriend, uh, what have you, the question is specifically, has your boyfriend or girlfriend, partner or spouse ever made you feel unsafe, insulted, harmed, or threatened in any way? This question can be difficult to ask if you have both parties in the room. Um, I try to kind of feel out the relationship if this is something, um, that I get a kind of off vibe between the couple that maybe it's not a safe situation. Um, in that case, uh, it would be smart to have one of them leave the room. So you can say, I have a couple of questions just for your spouse. Have the other spouse leave the room. Say, do you ever have it that you're feeling unsafe or uncomfortable with your partner? Um, 
So fill it out. We want to make sure that people have a safe space where they can answer honestly and truthfully. Um, there are pathways with asylum that someone could be granted that based on um, domestic violence. Um, so that's what this question is um, referring to, but also we want to make sure that our clients are safe after leaving their appointment with us. So if we do feel that something is off, please let a supervisor know so that we can try to serve the clients in the best way possible and get them connected with resources. Now, if you get the vibe that you can kind of ask this question uh, with both of them present, I'll trust your judgment on that, but don't be afraid to say, I have a couple more questions. Um, let me have you take a seat um, out in the waiting room, grab a cup of tea. I'm just gonna ask a couple more questions here and then we'll switch. So don't be afraid to set that boundary so that we can get truthful answers. Um, and then finally, um, is just general notes at the end. Let us know if the client was open to speaking with you, if they were hesitant, um, if you had an interpreter present, that's very important to list. You know, we had an interpreter by phone speaking Dari, red flags that we should know about. Uh, maybe the client's spouse wouldn't let her speak. I'm concerned that I didn't get an honest answers from her. Um, if there are any unique cases, I always like to conclude my interview with, is there anything else that you want us to know about your case? If they have a unique situation um, in regards to their special immigrant visa, or if maybe um, the person is a widow and their former spouse did work with the US military and they unfortunately passed away in active duty. Um, those aren't situations that come up um, very often, but we do want to be aware if they're connected with coming to the U.S. because of a family member that passed away. That can change how we process their case as well. And then finally, of course, I don't have a copy of it with me. Um, we do have kind of a next steps document that we'll be handing to them. This just lets them know kind of what's coming next. Uh, we make sure to write today's date on there, their name, their case number, and it also has an OAR email address where they can send any further documentation that they may have forgotten, or maybe they only have it on their phone. We have a lot of clients that may not have paper copies, but they have it saved on their phone. So any documents that, that, that we should have copies of, have them send it right to that email address. Try to have them list their name and their case number just so it's easier for us to match it up with their file. And then on the bottom, it'll be highlighted in blue, has our office phone number. They're welcome to call that number to speak with us. They can actually text us directly, or they can use it, uh, an app called WhatsApp, which is very common for our international clients to connect with family, friends. It's kind of a messaging video service. Um, so if they need to send us messages, they're welcome to use our phone number with WhatsApp as well. I hope this information is helpful. I know it can seem a little bit um, overwhelming when you're sitting down with a brand new client and you want them to feel safe and you have to ask some really big questions, but try to approach it as, hey, we're part of your team now. We're trying to figure out what path or paths we can take to get you to your immigration goals. We wanna make sure that as they're settling in a new country, that's a lot to take in, that we can get them started on that process and that they can feel welcome and safe and that somebody's on their side. We want to make sure that's an open space for them. I think that's all I have. So hopefully this is helpful. Again, feel free to ask um, Ileana Ponce or myself if you have any questions and uh, there's always staff around or other intake specialists that would be able to give you um, tips and pointers if you have questions. Thanks so much for helping. Um, it's been remarkable to see all of the ways that our community is surrounding our new Afghan, Afghan neighbors and just really connecting with them to make sure that they can get the services and the help that they need. So thanks for being part of it.